Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Western New South Wales Primary Health Network webinar for the Western New South Wales COVID-19 update. Thanks so much for taking your time out of your Tuesday evening to join us this evening as we get through a lot of information once again uh, during this webinar. My name is Anthony Thompson. I'm the Media and Communications Coordinator with Western New South Wales PHN. It is wonderful to have your company this evening. Before we get underway, First, we'd like to acknowledge that we work on the traditional lands of many Aboriginal clans, tribes and nations. And I would like to pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the traditional custodians who care for this land on which we work and live and which we're meeting on this evening. I also acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the communities in our region. Now this evening, again, this webinar is being recorded. It will be available to view for a limited time after the live session. And uh, for those that haven't been able to join us, we'll be sharing that information with them as well and also with you so you can look back upon it this evening. A link to the recording will be forwarded to all attendees again tonight. And at the completion of the webinar, uh, if you'd be so kind, you're invited to take a brief moment to complete an evaluation survey. Now, a little bit of housekeeping to start off. Where's your toolbar on this? Uh, go to meeting or go to webinar. Uh, if you can't see the control panel, just click on the small orange arrow that's usually at the top left hand side of your screen and then your panel will open to look like that demonstration there. Now every participant is in listen only mode. This is to optimize the sound quality for all participants. So if you have any questions or comments, please use the chat questions box that you'll find in the drop down of uh, that uh, control panel. And, our, and we'll be able to respond to each of your questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd be so kind to also in that chat, when you're posing a question, just make a note of who your question is posed to. You can click on this small triangle to open the dialog box and type your comments or questions there. Our presenters for this evening are from the Dubbo Respiratory Clinic. The, uh, we'll have the clinic spotlight by Dr. Sunil Jacob. Dr. Jacob Williams, the infectious disease physician from Orange, will join us for a Western New South Wales LHD update. Beth Mills from the Western New South Wales PHN will be talking about the EAP program we have on offer to support our healthcare professionals. And Dr. Ivy Chua, chair of the Western New South Wales PHN Western Clinical Council, will bring us health pathways and more on COVID-19 this evening. But to start us off, He's uh, sitting alongside us. Sarah's unfortunately unable to be with us tonight from the Dubbo Respiratory Clinic, clinical lead, uh, lead Dr. Sunil Jacob. Dr. Sunil, good evening. Hi. Thank you. And so um, uh, I'm, I'm representing the Dubbo Respiratory Clinic, and um, my name's Dr. Sunil Jacob, lead clinician. We're supported by our own team at Dubbo Medical Allied Health Group with a group of seven GPs, four nurses, and three admin staff. So the purpose of the clinic um, the clinic was set up for all patients suffering with mild to moderate respiratory symptoms, such as um, a runny nose, cough, breathlessness, tiredness, or fevers. All patients are assessed, swabbed, and treated. There is no cost to the patient, and it's available for Medicare cardholders and overseas citizens. Uh, the double respiratory clinic is kept, is kept to keep patients away, away with respiratory symptoms, away from other general practice patients and their, their health workforce. It also helps in alleviating any pressure on the emergency services. The initial setup um, was uh, was aided with our, our PHN and with Aspen Medical. Uh, we are in a standalone facility uh, with um, with everything in, with the patient layout in terms of how they enter, how they exit, with the four isolation rooms, so we are able to see four patients if required. Um, and it was supported by the by our PHN, the emergency department at Double Base, and the Department of Health. The facility adheres to a strict infection um, protocol between patients, and at, at the end of the day, with uh, PPE changes, uh, which is a gloves, gowns, masks, um, a, a mask between between patients, and sanitizing the room, sanitizing uh, the staff between patients. So, the, uh, uh, like when a typical patient, when a patient does come, they are, uh, all patients are booked either by phone or by web. Um, the, uh, the web access will be through hot docs. And um, the details are initially clocked in by the receptionist. Um, and uh, then followed uh, when the patient arrives at his or her 
at his or her appointment slot. They are triaged by the nurse while the patient awaits in the car. And uh, the patient is, um, once the history is taken, the patient is escorted into the facility, uh, given a mask on entry, uh, alcohol sanitize, uh, they're, they're given an alcohol sanitize um, to sanitize their hands, and they're taken into the, into the isolation room. At that point, if anything needs to be clarified with the, with the history, um, either the general practitioner or the, um, uh, mainly the general practitioner would be taking the history and um, a, swab, uh, a swab is taken after an examination. Uh, the swab is usually taken of the uh, tonsillar pillars and the uh, nasopharynx. Um, if, um, if antibiotics are required, if, it is a, uh, if it's required for a tonsillitis or required for any kind of uh, bacterial infection that's provided, um, advice is given regarding asthma care or, um, or um, what needs to be done in terms of isolation. And uh, we usually give them um, advice in terms of follow-up as well. Within 24 hours, um, our, our local pathology, Douglas Hanley Moyer Pathology, has been able to SMS the patient on on, on getting the on doing the swab, they're able to get the results on SMS. But we follow up with a phone call uh, in terms of the rest of the respiratory panel. We 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 check for COVID testing, but we also check for the entire respiratory panel: uh, influenza, parainfluenzas, rhino uh, rhino and adenoviruses. Um, and so we give them a phone call 36 hours later and um, ask them to follow up with their own general practitioner. Um, so far, the progress has been, it's been our fifth week and we've seen 650 patients. So averaging at about 140, 150 patients per week. And so um, they've, been, they've been all assessed, swabbed and treated. Um, Follow-up letters have been sent to their doctors. Um, most swabs, uh, all the swabs have come back negative for coronavirus. Um, about three in 10 were positive for rhino or adenoviruses. Um, the feedback has been uh, very positive from patients, and we have followed up all, all our patients from our last week. Uh, so presentations have varied from m most of them have come with common colds, um, some asthma flare-ups, some ear and throat infections, tonsillitis. Um, a few have been sent to hospital with CCF or COP COPD exacerbation. So in terms of challenges, um, I think at the moment um, ability to cope with larger numbers, and so following the Following this last long weekend, I think we have booked out possibly for tomorrow. We have possibly about one or two patient slots for tomorrow. And uh, yesterday, uh, tomorrow we had 45 appointments, but they've been booked in one day. And uh, the following day's appointments are being booked as well. And so I think at the moment, we were, I was talking to our um, clinical nurse, uh, our cl our clinical clinic manager, and she was um, uh, uh, like I was hoping to increase the number of Slots available by increasing either doctors and nurses appointments. And the second challenge would be if there is an outbreak in a in a, a larger with a larger employ, employer like um, the abattoir, how do we handle that? And so we've been kind of talking we've been talking with the abattoir as to uh, what an approach would be. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank Thanks, Sunil. Thanks for your presentation this evening. Moving next to the, our infectious disease physician from Orange, Dr. Jacob Williams. Dr. Jacob, good evening. There we go. Ah, there you go. All right, I'm off mute now. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I'm Jake Williams, I'm um, the infectious diseases physician at Orange Health Service. And so I just um, uh, wanted to talk you through a couple of um, the points about the landscape of where we're up to at the moment. Um, okay. Can we start with my first slide, if that's all right? Thanks, great. So this is a, a curve of um, uh, all the numbers of di case, diagnosed cases of COVID-19 um, uh, across the uh, country, and so I, I, um, I bring this slide up to kind of give you the overall trajectory of where we're up to. You know, the goal when I gave uh, my first talk uh, like this um, some months ago was to flatten the curve, 
uh, and you can see that the curve has been well and truly stomped. And that's you know a result of a number of factors. I mean, I think with the retrospectoscope, Australia always had a number of um, key things in our favour. Certainly, you know, a lot of our cases from the get-go were imported from overseas, and there was never a strong community transmission rate that was able to get out of control. The other thing is the demographic of those people who imported cases from overseas was that they fell into um, two major groups. They were either young people who had returned from overseas or older retired travellers. Certainly our local experience was that people who were diagnosed uh, before the mandatory quarantine who returned from overseas, certainly locally were older retirees, often um, uh, people with a relatively strong health understanding, good health care and social supports, and they were able to um, isolate themselves extremely well in the community and follow advice extremely closely. And certainly that um, contrasts with a lot of uh, cases that we've heard about anecdotally in the urban centres where people were often non-compliant with their um, their quarantine and were, um, you know, possibly out there creating community clusters. Certainly, um, uh, I think the other advantage is that um, we were able to control our borders quite early compared with other countries. And and although it was a terrible tragedy on a personal level in regards to loss of life, the Ruby Princess really snapped a lot of our um, local decision making and local systems into gear because we suddenly had a, a cohort of people um, who were positive very early in the piece that allowed us to kind of test our symptoms out and get everybody on the, the front foot with managing this problem. Um, can we move on to the next slide? So um, this is the, um, the second point I want to raise about why we've managed to achieve such a success. And so this is a this is New South Wales data, moving on from um, uh, data that's more uh, national. This is the um, uh, number of positive cases uh, in the blue lines uh, diagnosed each day and contrasted against the number of tests performed each day, which is the black bars. And the axis for the black belongs on the left and the right um, axis is for the blue lines. And you can see that uh, as time went on um, from about this period of uh, early to mid-April around Easter time, you can see a massive uptick, uh, upswing in our, our testing. And that, that um, came about in part because uh, we expanded our case definitions, we encouraged people to get testing, but certainly our laboratory capacity expanded rapidly. Our ability to do tests both locally and um, on a state level uh, really took off in that period as more laboratories came online and certainly it gave policymakers the ability to encourage early testing for symptomatic people or, or mass testing for people who had symptoms despite no epidemiological exposures and that's really at odds with um, the experience we've seen overseas where in some settings the application of testing was so rigorous that um, a vast majority of their cases to this day go undiagnosed. There is a um, you know, a, some advanced epidemiological modelling which basically looks at the number of um, uh, COVID-19 mortalities that you have. So you would imagine that uh, because uh, across health systems internationally, their ability to um, save the life or, or avoid mortality in someone with COVID-19 is generally quite fixed. You can infer from the number of tests you do, the no amount of mortality you have, and the number of cases you diagnose, what your catch rate is. So, you know, they can say, for example, that in the United Kingdom, when they report um, 100,000 cases, that's likely 30% of their total caseload. There are likely, you know, multiple number, multiples, multiples of that number undiagnosed in the community. Whereas in Australia, they had a, they could say with a relative degree of confidence that we would probably diagnosed at least 80 to 90% of our cases in the community. And that means that when you look at a number and you say there is X number of local cases of community transmission or X amount of activity in your community, as much as anybody can with a disease that has um, pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic spread, um, you can take those numbers to the bank. And I think that's part of what's underpinned an excellent um, uh, response so far. And it's part of why uh, our country has able, been able to, with some degree of confidence, roll back some of our more stringent quarantine measures earlier than any of us could have anticipated. Um, can we move on to the next slide? That's all right. And so I want to zoom in a bit locally um, because, uh, you know, I think it's important that we get a sense of our local picture. Certainly, um, or in, uh, the Western District's not had a positive case for some weeks, over a month. Um, and our testing rate, in spite of that, continues to be amongst the best in the state. So you can see here, this is the number of cases in the last four weeks by um, local health district. Uh, that's in the cases bar on the left. And it's the num there are those um, 
cases with unknown source or local transmissions in the last four weeks. Up until yesterday, we'd not had a case of um, local transmission from an unknown source for approximately 12 days. I understand there's a case currently under investigation in the last 24 hours that may not have a source, uh, but certainly those numbers are, are very encouraging. You can see that when you adjust for population, our LHD being one of the smaller ones um, in the state, you can see that our testing rate per thousand is, is on par with what you would expect, uh, 23 tests per thousand. So um, it certainly out, uh, matches sort of similar demographic areas like Murrumbidgee or mid-north coast and outstrips um, places like Western Sydney where they're, they're burdened by their large um, populations and their, their difficulty with some subsets of those populations accessing healthcare. Um, do you want to move on to the next slide if you could? Thanks. So, so currently I made the point that testing has really been the mainstay of what we're doing and certainly um, uh, Sunil talked about the um, access to respiratory clinics in Dubbo and we've certainly found the access um, for testing at the Orange Respiratory Clinic to be excellent. It's, it's, a, it's um, uh, allowed people to seek tests um, very rapidly with an excellent turnaround time but it's also taken the burden off our hospital fever clinic which um, uh, you know, at the time as was I'd still continue to see a large amount of presentations, but less, certainly less than there was. And um, this is just to reiterate the current um, testing criteria that everyone with respiratory symptoms or an unexplained fever should be tested. We certainly test all um, our inpatient uh, respiratory admissions still uh, and all our unexplained fevers. And the um, availability of the gene expert rapid test has been instrumental in being able to do that safely because um, I'm sure we've all seen in our own settings how managing for COVID as a daily presence and a daily threat has an opportunity cost with regards to normal business. And certainly we found in a hospital setting that um, caring for someone as a query COVID did not provide a same, the same experience, if not the same quality of healthcare as managing them as COVID negative. And so we found that by expediting their test results to the Gene Expert platform, it really has um, smoothed over a lot of the bumps on the road with regards to the patient journey when we know the pretest probability is low. And as um, Sunil talked about as well, there are certainly some high risk settings that are a, a large amount of concern in terms of their potential for outbreaks. We've talked about, I think he mentioned abattoirs, you know, certainly there's mining across our region that is um, has a lot of trend, um, fly in, fly out and, and workers in transit. And there's always the vulnerable cases we've seen both low, um, in our state at Newmarch House, but certainly overseas as well. Uh, the terrible impact that COVID-19 can have in an aged care setting and um, you know we have um, and the public health unit is very very aware of all those risks and is working closely with those partners and there is a, um, a very keen um, response uh, that's uh, in it will become entrained very quickly should a, a signal appear in those places and I want to just stress that these are the local guidelines is that sorry the state guidelines is that asymptomatic people shouldn't be tested um, it is not only are not a great use of resources, but also there is a significant amount of risk. You know, um, if we can move on to the next slide, that's all right. So there are, you know, I think these are the cases that brought that into to clear focus, which is that, you know, false positives do happen. Um, they happen for a number of reasons. The assay itself is excellent, but certainly things like laboratory error or specimen confusion or, um, in some rare cases, um, failure of the, the assay to detect a, a related virus certainly can relate that can result in po um, positive cases that are not true positives. I've certainly dealt personally with a false positive case locally um, that caused a large amount of concern and consternation. And the thing I really want to drill down here is that this is a real and present danger when you talk about a disease that has such a low prevalence. And so if you do a thousand tests, and the population prevalence is essentially zero, you can't necessarily take even one positive test to the bank because your pretest probability was so low that you know, with a, even with a um, specificity uh, of 99.9%, you, you are almost certainly, it has an equally high chance of being a false positive. And so you know, we, there's a lot of mention of asymptomatic screening, both in a school setting or an employment setting. And although we can't necessarily, as a public health service, stop those if they want to engage the work of private contractors. I think we should be clear that um, it's not a Medicare abatable test and it's not without risks. Um, can we move on to the next slide if that's all right? And so I um, haven't um, gone into detail about the, the local public health picture because um, I um, did anticipate Priscilla would be speaking to that, but certainly I can field questions on 
on that. I just wanted to focus in on what's happening at an LHD level at a hosp for hospitals. So um, Orange Health Services um, recommenced elective surgery some weeks ago and it's stepping up its um, activity. It will soon be at 75% and um, in a couple of weeks our 23-hour um, ward, our short stay surgical unit will reopen. Uh, we are running extra lists to try and clear a backlog and so we are approaching a return to normal service delivery. Uh, and I mentioned the, um, the you know, excellent um, assistance that we're gaining from the, um, uh, from the respiratory clinics that are happening around the district and certainly Orange uh, Health Service uh, as a hospital and, and the Orange Respiratory Clinic are working in parallel. They have um, opening hours where they're both open and um, we are working towards uh, streamlining that so that the two are not competing for business essentially, that everybody can have a test um, when they need a test but ultimately um, we're not double handling. And um, on an operational level, our emergency department has returned to its previous footprint after at one stage having split into hot and cold zones. We're not seeing a large amount of influenza presentations for obvious reasons around the high rate of vaccination and social distancing on flows and decreased international travel. So we're not finding a large amount of surge in our ED for winter at early days, touch wood. Uh, but also our specialty clinics are being resumed and Although the specialists who do telehealth um, as a matter of normal business or feel comfortable are continuing to do that at higher rates, certainly um, the specialist cohort within the hospital is beginning to see patients face-to-face um, -face more frequently. My clinics, for example, would have one or two telehealths, but majority would be face-to-face. -face. And that's part of the reasoning behind that is, you know, ultimately the signals that are that we're getting are good ones that um, the prevalence in the community currently is low. We'll wait to see what happens over the next couple of weeks um, following those mass gatherings over the weekend. But um, there is no time better than now. Um, we have to adjust to a, a situation like this where there is um, some activity but not no activity. But we have to be able to deliver high quality healthcare for the foreseeable future whilst balancing those risks. Um, and as we go on, um, things will always be in a better position than they were. Certainly anybody with COVID-19 who is admitted to hospital tomorrow has a much higher chance of getting um, care based on better evidence and care that's better resourced than they would have three months ago. So certainly everything um, that's happened so far has been for the better and um, the longer we can stave off any uh, ongoing disease activity, the better it will be. Um, so that's all I had to say tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Williams, for your time this evening. Don't forget if you have a question for Jake or indeed you had a question for Sunil from earlier, don't forget you can ask your question via your uh, uh, video conference portal there. Just uh, use the arrow to drop down the chat and remember to address your question to the relevant person. Next, from Western New South Wales PHN, we have our Project Officer of Community Wellbeing. Beth Mills, who is going to tell us about our employee assistance program during these very difficult COVID-19 times. Good evening, Beth. Thanks, Anthony. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, just to let everybody know, the Primary Health Network has actually sought expressions of interest to um, support organisations throughout our PHN, and they consist of targeting private health service providers and health-related small businesses. Um, what we're working towards is supporting their staff throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and we're focused on providing them with a service. Um, so that service will provide 24-hour support seven days a week. It's going to be through a support line. It's going to be available for the next three months with the option of extending that to the pending the COVID-19 restrictions. What we're doing is um, we're limiting five sessions per employee and obviously the consult consultations will be undertaken through a secure video link um, or via teleconferencing or phone, whatever supports that person in need. Next slide please. Next slide again, I'm sorry I'm one step ahead of you, thank you. So who's eligible for this? It's going to be um, private health providers um, and health related smaller businesses within our primary health network. Um, we're directing it through to mainstream health service providers, which is including general practice, um, medical services, Aboriginal medical services, allied health, mental health services, specialist medical centres, um, pharmacy and dental services. Next slide, please. 
So working with them, we will just want to re reiterate here that it's not an emergency service. We're currently in the process of um, working with a service provider that's actually been contracted to provide the service throughout the region. And we will be directly contacting all of the practices that have provided us with an expressions of interest to go through the process of how their staff can access the service. But I want to reiterate here that it is actually going for the next three months and we will look at it again to extend the service if needed, pending the actual COVID-19 restrictions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Beth. Uh, the details to get in contact with Beth to find out more about the EAP program is on the screen for you now, or unless you forget about it and think about it later. It's also on our website at wnswphn.org.au. If you have a question for Beth, of course, put it into the, uh, the questions that will get answered for you later. Next, our Western New South Wales PHN Western Clinical Council Chair, the face and the voice of our new Don't Put Your Help on Hold campaign as well, <laughs> Dr Ivy Tua. Dr Ivy, good evening. Thank you, Anthony. I might add, there was a bit of pressure from Anthony to put together the ad and radio, so <laughs> thanks to Anthony that's, uh, that's underway. Um, Don't mention it, Ivy. <laughs> can people see that screen that says Health Pathways? I will take that's that up now, well. Ivy. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So a little bit of an introduction to Health Pathways. Um, it's there as a point of care resource for clinicians um, and, it's, and it's a fairly unique combination of evidence-based steps um, to help us at the point of care decide with our patients what the best way of assessing them and managing them is for particular conditions. Um, and in our current setting, we've got COVID-19 health pathway that's underway and I'll, I'll take you through um, the website in a minute. Um, well, there's been a, a fair bit of work done just on the COVID-19 health pathway as is, as is and um, a lot of discussions by local clinicians, um, LHD clinicians, uh, allied health, et cetera, in conjunction with general practice to be able to develop up what we have our, as our COVID-19 health pathway right now. There's also request or um, rather what we know um, and love as um, referral information that's pertinent to our region, which sometimes it's not so easy for us as GPs to access, but um, it's all up there on health pathways. So a little bit more about the wider background with health pathways. It actually came about in Canterbury, New Zealand um, quite some time ago and they developed it in, a, in their patch because um, they recognised the need for a single source of truth, a um, single source of pathway for their clinicians there um, to permit um, integrated patient-centred healthcare um, and to reduce variation in care that was occurring in their region. Um, it has since expanded into all of New Zealand, uh, all of Australia, and Western New South Wales is actually the last little patch of Australia to adopt health pathways. Um, and the UK is also adopting health pathways, um, which means it's a fantastic collaboration of evidence-based resources that once um, we as clinical editors all get together to discuss um, particular pathways. Um, and so when you look at the, um, all the uh, population that's influenced by um, health pathways care, um, that equates to about 25 million people at the moment. So um, you would have seen um, our GP teams and, and hopefully our LHD teams would have seen um, uh, little flyers come about in the last few weeks that talks about how to access health pathways. And whilst it's designed primarily for GP teams at the point of care, it's certainly available to other clinicians in our region as well. Um, and I hope that this was okay by Sonia to make the username and password all available, but um, it's clicking onto that uh, onto that um, website address, um, usernames there and the passwords there. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to write that down if you need to, but um, you can certainly email um, for details. You haven't quite caught that. 
So looking specifically at the COVID-19 pathway, um, an incredible amount of work uh, and a lot of help from a lot of um, really great people um, to be able to feed into our local COVID-19 health pathway um, in the last few weeks. And that ranges from PHN staff, LHT staff, um, GP respiratory clinic people, um, and also acknowledging the wider New South Wales ACT clinical editor network. So each region um, have got a, a bunch of GPs who are there as clinical editors. Um, and each week we've been meeting up to um, make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of updating our uh, local health pathways uh, relevant for COVID-19. So I'll just take us to the link. So when you enter Health Pathways, um, hopefully you can all see the website at the moment. Um, you'll see, if you want to have further details about how the mechanism of Health Pathways works, um, click on about Health Pathways and it's got you know, little bits and bobs around there. But I just wanted tonight to show you about um, our COVID-19 Health Pathway in particular. The contents and navigation is all on the left hand side there. Um, it's very user friendly, just click away. Um, you'll see that it, everything's designed to have lots of click points so that what you see on the one page um, ought to be fairly easy to just cast your eye over. Um, so for example, this bit here that talks about COVID-19 information, the first section is local information um, and then you follow on to uh, state and national resources that are available. Um, in the local information, um, there's, there's some of the PHN webinars that have been produced to date. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to really important things for us in general practice with donning and doffing, um, doing the swabbing if that's pertinent to your service. Um, we've got the um, webinar that Jake had run um, in the early days. Um, and then there's um, the update that had also occurred um, late April um, for pharmacists. There's a pharmacy specific webinar that was there. Um, initial assessment and management. Now this is actually um, prepared and updated um, on a very regular basis. And you can see last updated 8th June, just yesterday. Um, the region that's got the lead on this particular um, aspect of the COVID-19 pathway is Hunter New England um, and their clinical editor is currently not sleeping at all and hasn't slept for about two months I think um, but she each time she updates things it goes straight to New South Wales Health the ministry endorses it before it gets published onto Health Pathway overnight. You'll see on there there's a background information it's a very practice um, relevant assessment information um, management details there and it's probably best if you go in and have a look and click on all those things yourselves to, to see what's relevant for your um, particular situation. Requests and local processes, this is very much Western New South Wales. Um, so if you click on assessment and testing you can see that we've got our emergency department um, links there. We've got our ability to have assessment and testing done via our GP respiratory clinics, our seven GP respiratory clinics across the region now, um, but also our hospital fever clinics based at our um, large uh, regional centres. There's a little bit of advice about notification, should there be a positive result. Um, there's some further work will be done in the next week or two around how you can access further advice by local clinicians, um, a little bit about how you can order further masks. Um, I'll let you go through that in your own time, but I just want to finish off with this um, very important um, blue button on the bottom right here. Um, these pages um, are only as good as the feedback that we get. Um, and whilst we do our best to chat with everybody involved and up, up, upload all the relevant information locally, um, we've got a big region to look after. And so it'd be great if you could um, send feedback. If you see there's something that um, you know more information about than we do, um, just uh, click on that send feedback button and follow through those prompts. 
um, and we'll be able to update things you know within a matter of 24 hours. Okay, any questions? More than happy to answer. We'll hand back to you now. We do have, uh, and we do have a little bit of time for questions. So uh, via the uh, the video conference portal there, you can see the questions drop down. Uh, we do have one that's come through from David Howe. Uh, my practice has been very quiet in the past few weeks. I'm concerned that respiratory clinics are taking over a proportion of GP work and leaving small practices like mine to struggle financially. That's indeed something that we've been hearing here at the PHN, which was also part of the inspiration behind our Don't Put Your Health on Hold uh, campaign, which is going to be heard and seen across uh, increasingly across uh, commercial television and radio stations during the course it started last week, but it will be uh, on air during the course of these two months through to the end of July, and that'll be definitely ramping up during the course of the next two weeks. But have you got any other thoughts on that, Dr. Sunil? Um, you know, at the Double Respiratory Clinic, we're seeing about 30 patients per day, and it's not coming it's from a town size of 50,000, and they come from Narromine, they come from Wellington, so it's not, not large numbers. Uh, it's, it's there for another six weeks. And it's really there for if we do need to ramp up, we do have our health workforce um, ready for um, ready for that eventuality. Um, most of them access it through Health Direct or even through GP, through the general practice front desks. And the sole purpose is really assessing and swabbing. And they don't come for re-swabs, so it's not as if they're there for treating an uh, tr uh, ongoing treatment of a bronchitis or COPD. It's just a one one only kind of, uh, they, uh, when we see them on one occasion, we don't see them repeatedly. We just see them on that one occasion for assessing and swabbing. Um, in terms of treatment, uh, um, look, out of 30 patients, you might send, do one script for a tonsillitis. The, and uh, because I do work in general practice for the other four and a half days, uh, I do realize that patient numbers are down and we're doing lots of, maybe tw 10 to 15% are through telephone links or through t uh, telehealth um, and patients are getting a lot more confident in coming terms uh, coming into the into the practice and uh, we have been reassuring them with all the infection and in, um, in terms of the infection protocols that we have in our own general practice um, places of work but if you look at influenza numbers they're down by at least 90 percent this month compared to last uh, last year may last year and so uh, hopefully that, hopefully things are going to improve. Um, so what you're suggesting is that there's more than just the yeah. in introduction of respiratory clinics that has yeah, been a factor here. The respiratory clinics are, are, are really for if, if something was to flare up in the community. And um, rather than, and, uh, you know, it's most likely going to be uh, closing down or scaling down in about six weeks' time anyway. Righty -o. Uh Still a couple of moments if you've got any urgent questions uh, that we can address for you this evening. Um, feel free to uh, pop that question into the questions tab. Um, I think like, you know, in terms of the health, um, you know, especially in our front desk or our nurses or even our doctors, they feel a lot more comfortable coming into the workplace knowing that no one's not, not going to be sneezing or coughing. Um, uh, like there's a, they seem a lot more at peace, you know, not, not frightened of assessing patients in car parks. And it's been we quite the living experience. Here in the orange office. Hi, it's Ivy Chua here. I just had a question, a couple of questions for Jake. Um, in relation to the expanded text testing that um, New South Wales Health and the Department of Health are very much pushing. Um, we've certainly seen as schools have gone back into gear and there's a lot more um, community contact with each other, we've certainly seen a lot of those other things that we would normally expect during the winter period arising again. So I guess specific questions around, you know, babies and young kids. Mm -hmm. um, should we be testing every single one of those who present with respiratory symptoms, a nose, bit of a cough, um, bit of a fever, 
So that's question number one. Um, and the question number two is in relation to COVID-19 that we know, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, potentially being part of the symptom complex there. Um, and I think in Dubbo, because one of, of the patients did present solely with diarrhea yeah, yeah. initially, should we be testing those people, even if they don't have respiratory mm -hmm. symptoms? Sure. So I'll speak to the first question up front. I think the issue of um, what to do with ch children in particular is a difficult one. Um, certainly there is the need to put clinical judgment at the forefront around, you know, do you think that this person is, you know, what is the cost of doing this test essentially at some degree? Not, I don't mean financial, but I mean like it's an invasive test, right? It's not comfortable. And, um, you know, if you've tested other family members for respiratory illness and this kid's got one, then it makes the question easier, right? It's not an edict, you must test everyone. I think that ultimately what it comes down to is, um, the difficulty in you cannot delineate um, COVID-19 from you know parainfluenza basically that's where it becomes challenging and I think you need to have a real discussion with the patient and well not the patient because they're a child but obviously the parent and the caregiver and talk about the things that fit into a decision matrix and come to a decision that you feel comfortable with I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all approach uh, but I think that if you if it was as simple as you know you're going to this is a child who's, um, you know, may have some risks in terms of their, you know, they've travelled or to Sydney or whatever, or they've got, you know, it's unexplained, it's novel, it doesn't sit right. Then certainly, I would, I would encourage you to test that child. But I think it's not as simple as simply testing all of them. I know that's a very, I'm not giving you a great answer, Ivy, but it's a very, I, I'm, I recognise a challenging situation. Yeah. Um, the second question around what to do with primary GI symptoms, I think you can recognise that. You know, when you look at case series, um, probably only five to ten percent of COVID-19 in an epidemic presented with um, diarrhea and vomiting, um, or diarrhea was the predominant symptom. And diarrhea in the absence of respiratory symptoms would also be unusual. I think that um, the whole symptom complex is important. So the presence of fever would be important um, because that would be much more likely and that's not always common in a diarrheal illness. Um, protracted symptoms for fever as well would be important and the, any respiratory symptom would trigger a test. So I think if someone comes with just diarrhea and abdominal pain, I wouldn't test them at the front door. But if they've got diarrhea, subjective fevers or sweats, um, possibly again, they're a more transient population, if, especially if there's a signal in the future that there's more disease around, then I don't think you've got anything to lose by doing a test. But I've had people say, you know, um, should I test the stool for COVID-19? Should I do multiple tests, you know, for someone's not quite getting better and the first was negative? I don't think that's necessary. I think one test, if you think the whole clinical syndrome is suggestive, is worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. And so can I clarify? So that's a, a stool PCR. So so it's not actually a so it's not a test that we do. It's a, available in a res, in a research capacity. Yeah. So people have asked me, should I do it? Because they read that this, the virus is detectable in stool, and um, we cancel against that because um, we don't have a good idea about the test performance. Um, we certainly um, don't think that it can prepare that it performs better than a nasopharyngeal swab uh, so it's not not necessary and again if you do a test that's not well validated and you're not really sure how to interpret the result it's a bit of a fraud undertaking okay thank you right yeah with that i think we've got just about all of our questions answered uh we do have that health pathways slide up for you at the moment just if you'd like to note down that link. And as Ivy was so uh, kind in sharing the username and the password as well, make sure you note that down and you'll be able to get onto um, Health Pathways. So if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank our presenters for this evening, Dr. Samuel Jacob, Dr. Jacob Williams, also Beth Mills and Dr. Ivy Tour as well. Uh, we will provide this link for you as well to uh, look, look at uh, uh, another time, we should have that link available to uh, all of our attendees this evening within the next 24 hours. My name has been Anthony Thompson. Thanks so much for being a part of this evening's Western New South Wales Primary Health Work webinar. Have a good evening.